Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. We have a very special episode today. We're going to be interviewing a great friend, Father Michael Larkin. That's right. Father Larkin's been a priest for many, many years, and we're going to look at his journey as a priest and how the church has changed in his experience in his time as the priest. Father Larkin came from Ireland as a young priest, and he has an incredible journey he wants to share with you. And I am so blessed, Father Larkin, that you are a brother priest here in the Diocese of St. Augustine and one that I look up to and get to work with each and every week here at St. John Paul II. So, Father Larkin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Let's get this kicked off here. Great to be sitting next to you, Father Larkin. Really excited to hear your story. You're an FBI. You're foreign-born Irish, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and not many people know out there that FBI's was a real thing. You know, yeah. like the FBI's a real powerhouse in the Catholic Church, and it is the foreign-born Irish. The church would not be in the That's prosperous right. situation that it is in today without the Irish deposit of faith. And there are many books written about it, but how often do you get a chance to actually listen firsthand to someone who actually came from Ireland, from that cultural setting, and really dedicating your life for 50 plus years really to the fasc- priesthood of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's really fascinating. The first time I ever heard of that, I read a book by George Weigel called Courage to be Catholic, and he kind of alluded to all the foreign-born Irish and a lot of the, the cultural situations that they came from. So this is going to be a really great episode. Yeah, there's a great book by an author named Thomas Cahill, and he wrote How the Irish Saved Civilization. Mm. And it's a great book talking about how, uh, you know, the circumstances that led to the Irish diaspora around the world really saved and preserved so much of what we dearly hold in Western society. So, so Father Larkin, as an Irishman, did the Irish save civilization? Well, let me first of all say (laughs) that all three of the people around this table with me knew that I was coming, and they had a a prepared statement. (laughs) I'm I'm the only one that didn't know what was going to (laughs) happen. Surprise! But yeah, but I I, I do believe that they they helped to to save civilization. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's it's inspiring to see, you know, the Irish church and, and I have, you know, my last name is Pagano, but I do have Irish roots uh, in the Mars and the Monahans and and certainly uh, my great grandmother. Uh, I pray with her rosary, uh, you know, all the time. And I'm just so blessed. And my maternal grandmother, uh, Ellen Prosha. Um, she was Ellen Marr. It was that Irish root of faith, and and one of her brothers that went into the seminary, but he got kicked out within a week. Father Larkin. I mean, he was. Uh, Even I lasted longer. Than you that. lasted longer than my uncle Jimmy. That's for sure. <laughs> it was it was very easy to get kicked out of an Irish seminary. I guarantee you. Really, it yeah. seemed so like you it was a tough, seminary yeah. in Ireland. I went to the seminary in Ireland. Okay, where, uh, where about? Right in a, in a place called Wexford, St Peter's. Seminary in Wexford, which is down in the southeast corner of the country, like Florida is to the United States. Ah. Yeah. So, but I went, I was from Galway and I went to high school in Galway and uh, then went to the seminary in St. Peter's. So, what was the, uh, yeah. the culture like back then when you went into the seminary? And what, yeah, what year was what this? What realities were, were going on that there were so many young men going into the seminary there? Well, I told you, uh, I was ordained in 1959, and I came to the United States, and we arrived in New York on the 25th of August, and by uh, the U.S. America, and uh, we didn't fly out the first time around, and I always thought it was a very wise move on the part of Archbishop Hurley, who was our bishop at the time, to give us the time on the ship to figure out some of the uh, changes that we would encounter, mm. uh, like uh, just money. And, mm. and it was so easy to learn the American system because everything was on the decimal, you know, as opposed to Irish 
coinage mm. in those days. Yeah, you had a farthing, you had a, a half penny, you had a penny, you had 12 pennies to make a shilling, mm. and you had 20 shillings to make a pound. And the pound was the mm -hmm. most recognized part mm -hmm. of uh, the Irish currency. Mm -hmm. But all of that has changed now, and they have uh, the euro because mm -hmm. they're under the euro zone. What right. was, uh, out of curiosity, what was the seminary like? Because we were kind of joking around and how you could get kicked out of the seminary, an <laughs> Irish seminary being one of them, you know, that that was a very easy thing to do. Like, what was what was the life of the seminary like for you? And, and share some of those differences. That's fascinating. Well, you know, I'll tell you, the, the most serious one was the silence after mm. night prayer. That could not be broken. That mm. was the golden silence. And if you broke that uh, twice, on the third time, you uh, you would be expelled. So Delacroix, my uncle did get kicked out in a week. It's because he skipped school and went to Macy's with his buddy, and then they went off to World War II. But you would, you would have not lasted a week. You would have been right there night. with my uncle. Yeah. I remember a silent retreat one time for seven days, and we all put bets in to see who would speak first. So well, we didn't have a Macy's in Ireland. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, this is New York City. This is Manhattan. I know what you mean. Oh, yeah. I know what you mean. You know. Yeah, yeah. So you were coming over. You know, you you were ordained in 1959. You're leaving Ireland. You're coming to the United States, and this is right around when uh, Vatican II was about to happen. So I mean, you experienced a lot of. Oh, uh, goodness, fundamental yeah. change in the mm -hmm. very beginning of your priesthood. What was that experience like? Like going from Ireland to America, going from yeah. the church before Vatican II Absolutely. to the post-Vatican II church That's in so such true. a short That's time a lot frame. of change. Absolutely. The, the two cultures are uh, totally different and were probably even more different that time. Uh, there was a guy by the name of John D. Sheridan who wrote a poem about uh, the ordination of a new priest. And it was called The Priesting of Father John. And it goes like just the first stanza. It says, they'll be priesting him tomorrow. Throt is hard to understand. For I mind the rascal that he was and the things he used to do. I chased him when the strawberries were ripe, but I own I never caught him. He was faster than a snipe. Mm -hmm. But I'll kneel there for Nenstam in all the mud and dirt. And I will ask him, if anything should happen to me before you go away, so there's nobody but yourself I want to shrive me for the clay. Mm. You know, and that wow. was, uh, you know, so well written mm -hmm. that it kind of uh, defines the feeling, and there are the other standards, it stands as, as well, it defines how the people felt uh, about somebody becoming a priest in that society. Uh, they were, when I came home from the seminary after ordination, there were bonfires for about five miles, uh, parishioners of the parish where I grew up, and they would, they were celebrating and, you know, it was something mm. that I, I had not anticipated. And then uh, I remember getting home and and my first, and again, I wasn't, you know, in those days, you know, I, I guess I depended uh, a little too much on the Holy Spirit, but I'll never forget getting up on, the, uh, the, on a flatbed truck and talking to all these people. Mm. And I felt so comfortable doing that, I could never fully explain it. It was mm. just amazing, you know, how the Holy Spirit took over, mm. and I guess the grace of ordination, mm. and, uh, you know, and gave uh, gave me, anyhow at that time, uh, the, the gift of being able to talk to people, even though I, I wasn't, uh, you know, fully prepared for that, as I would mm. be today. I'd be more prepared today for a homily or any statement, yeah, but, well, but not then. 
Right. What a beautiful image of mm. just all the parishioners in celebration and, you know, the bonfire and the St. Uh, Patrick bonfire. It's, it's, it's so tied thing. to, you know, to my understanding of Irish culture. And then just to see that celebration of the people thanking God for the for the elevation of a new priest, you know, that's, we don't have that here, you know. No, and the symbolism of what the light means and how the light is passed and and how all people gather at attention Absolutely. for the person of Jesus Christ, you know, very much present to the mystery of ordination and holy orders and and how you described it so beautifully. I mean, my eyes are welling up with tears and my heart and soul is just like dilated right now receiving. And I'm sure there are people online that are that are feeling the same way, but you know, entering into your identity as a priest after your ordination and having the consolation of the Spirit, the consolation of the Holy Spirit, where you're realizing this is a calling from God. And and that poem, what a powerful mm-hmm. poem. Again, the name of that poem? Uh, the Priesting of Father John. And it's uh, by a man by the name of John D. Sheridan, A-S-H-E-R-I-D-A-N. Wow. Sheridan. Yeah, we'll put the whole right. link to that. Um, in the show notes, in yeah. In the show notes. Just, I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, one of the things that wasn't addressed in the, one of the books I read historically <clears throat> about why, you know, we talked about diaspora of Irishmen, um, in particular priests to the United States. What, what what was the reason for that? Like, why, why were so many Irish priests being uh, sent to the United States? I know now we... We see Nigerians and, and even Ireland. Yeah, like Irish, I mean, yeah, yeah, the Irish going to Africa. The, I mean, the missions that were really rooted from from the Irish Church around the world. Where were some of the other missions, Father it, Larkin, it, from your memory? Well, I mean, it, it, there were certain religious orders mm-hmm. in Ireland. We were in a seminary that uh, only uh, taught diocesan priests, mm-hmm. so we were for the English speaking missions, Mm -hmm. you know, but you also had uh, the SMAs, the Society for African Missions, and they they went to Africa, and you had the Holy Ghost Fathers, and uh, when they were kicked out of Biafra, they came and ministered here in the Diocese of St. Augustine, and they were literally, you know, tremendous guys. Oh, they know. really were. And uh, we, we really appreciated having them at the time, mm-hmm. you know, and and, uh, and they were from Ireland too. Now, of course, the percentage of Irish priests right now is, is uh, very low in the diocese. And it is also low in the Irish uh, uh, seminary. They have only one seminary left. Mm. Uh, there were five seminaries like the one that I went to, and they're all uh, turned over to uh, secular education at this particular time, wow. you know. Wow. So, and but at the time that I was ordained, the home was the domestic church. I mean, yes. there was no question. Every morning, uh, you know, we go out to school. There were five of us kids, and the the sight that you would see would be your mom and dad on their knees, praying as you left the house to go to school. We walked to school. So it was hard uh, to grow up and not be affected by uh, that type of uh, prayer life in the home. These were just ordinary folks, but they they loved the Lord, and they, uh, they had deep faith and uh, and the reason that there were so many vocations at the time uh, is because of that domestic church. Were there, out of curiosity, you had five, five, uh, ch- your parents had five children. Out of those I, five children, did you have other vocations in the church too? Oh, yes. I, 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 my oldest sister uh, married, and God rest her soul, she's dead now. My, the next one in the family is uh, Patricia, and her she is a mercy nun order, and she was uh, the principal of an all girls high school for many many years in Ireland, and now she's retired, and she is ninety three. I don't know whether oh, she was ninety three on 
the 12th of September. I don't know whether she would appreciate my telling her age. But, but, wow. And then I had an older brother who was the one who stayed on the farm, and he has died. And then uh, my younger brother is a, is a priest, and he's retired now. He's uh, just... Uh, uh, four and a half years younger than I am. Is he in Ireland? And he is in Ireland, yeah. And but where, he has been out he here. In he is in Galway City, and he lives at uh, what they call in Ireland the assistant pastor's house. He was a pastor. He re- retired when the age came, mm-hmm. and now he helps uh, a priest friend of his, or friend of mine too, mm-hmm. and he lives at the curate's house, it's called, the curate's house. The pastor has his house, and the curate or the assistant has his own house as well. So that's where he lives. Well, if you ever want to live in the house, Father Larkin, you know, you help me out, and I'm so blessed as a young priest. I'm not even, I'm I'm so green, it's not even funny. I'm like more than that. uh, 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 Richard. You can stay in Father Tetlow's room. I know, (laughs) I know. I, I, I know uh, Father Richard Pagano for many years, and uh, I was uh, totally impressed with him as a seminarian. And there was another guy who was a seminarian at the time, and he, you know, and, you know, for some reason, the people in the parish were saying to me, we like this guy, Richard, you know? And I was surprised, Richard, at the time. <laughs> you still are? You're still surprised. So true. You're still not, surprised. Not today. I, it took me longer <laughs> to understand <laughs> how That's that warm-blooded Irish heart right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's been a, a wonderful experience, Mm -hmm. you know, ordained in 59, which makes it uh, 63 years as a priest. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was uh, 43 years in the parish before I retired. And I think I have the record for the longest uh, time in a parish. All at at the same parish. In the same parish for 43 years. But I, I don't know whether the record means anything. What <laughs> <laughs> Father Larkin's that? early Prince of Peace, okay, Prince wow. of Peace. which is right around the corner from where you you grew up, uh, you know, a driving distance, you know, like short drive. But um, Father Larkin also before he became the pastor, because you you really basically built everything out there. The, the oh Prince yeah, well, there was, yeah, church. We, we and started the, the par- started the par- parish started, the started parish. in 1970, right? Wow. Right. And then prior to that, you were in my neck of the woods in Flagler County for a little while. Flagler County was a tremendous experience. <laughs> I'm tremendous, so blessed that tremendous. You were there. I was three months ordained yeah. when uh, Archbishop Hurley appointed me the administrator of the missions of Flagler <laughs> County. Wow, what's now, that like going from you know misty green Ireland to the beaches of Florida? And you know you had to learn how to drive and <laughs> yeah. and, and and all kinds of things to mm. stay alive <laughs> and and you know and watch out for snakes and stuff mm. that you never uh, encountered. But but you know it was a tremendous experience. The people were very kind. There was a, a community of Polish people in St. Mary's in Corona. Mm-hmm. And uh, not saying that they were better than the ones at Bonnell, but the older Polish people were about the kindest people mm. that I've ever met. It's mm-hmm. just wonderful. They were tremendous to mm-hmm. me, and I feel like I learned quite a bit, mm-hmm. you know in those early days. And there's yeah. still remnants of that Polish community still in yeah. the southern part of Flagler County, right Absolutely. on the border of the Diocese of St. Augustine yes. and the Diocese of Orlando. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you, you've you mentioned Archbishop Hurley a couple of times, and this man is a man of great decisiveness and and uh, really, you know, uh, his personality and his Curious. legend and is, like, still impactful today. He's influenced my priesthood, and I've never met him before. Can you describe and characterize this uh, this great prince of the church and, and Archbishop Hurley? Uh, well, he, he was larger than life. Mm. He was not a tall man as such, but he 
had the ability to make his presence felt uh, in places that he was not at the time. And uh, <laughs> pastors, put it. pastors had a kind of, I would say, uh, reverential fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very, very exacting when it came to, uh, you know, sending money to the bishop because because he built all of these things, uh, you know, around the diocese. And most of all, he bought the land that a lot of parishes are built on today. Yes. And, and he was a man of foresight. Mm. And uh, nobody could have anticipated what he anticipated. But it was expensive, so the pastors had to... <laughs> come up with the with the money mm. you know but he was he was very kind to young priests and he would greet you personally and by your first name and he would always want to talk about you and how you were doing so you know uh, in those days when you know the distance between bishop and priests was greater uh, archbishop hurley uh, broke that mold, wow. you know, and wow. he, you know, he was, he was very kind and very gentle. And very Archbishop gentle. Joseph Patrick Hurley. That is correct. Was the one who brought you to the United States. Absolutely. And gave you your first assignment in the missions of Flagler County. And did, when you were sent, you had to, you've never driven before or like at that point or? I had driven a car in Ireland, uh, but the steering wheel was on the other side. <laughs> uh, first it sounds time. like you've had a couple of close calls. Well, the first time, me no, and... No, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, me and Ryan went to Ireland together, and we had to rent a car, so we go to the rental place, and... Uh, <laughs> you were so conscious of this, too. We were so conscious. We're like, okay, now... Okay. You know, I'm like, it was like, all we have is a stick shift. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I don't know how to do it. That would be too awkward with your left hand. So then, and I'm like, no, Shifting? it's on the yeah. other side. And they drive on the other side of the road. So we get in the car. We're like, okay, Ryan, you got this? Remember, other side of the road. So he's on the <coughs> other side of the car. We immediately had to do a U-turn, which totally. <laughs> a U-turn in a stick shift. We're going the wrong lane of traffic. We're like, dude, this is not bad. This is, this is, but then we ended up driving from Dublin all the way up to the Giants Causeway. It was close, <laughs> man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we almost ended it there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this show would have never existed. That's right. Yeah, it was scary. I really loved yeah. our time in Ireland, though. Um, the kind of, you could still see the reverberations of the deep Catholic sure. culture there, even though they've experienced so much change in the last 20 years or 25 years. Yeah. But uh, Ireland was really a blessed time, and I can't wait to get back there. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Yeah, a big um, shout out to all of our Irish followers because we're the number one Christian podcast on iTunes. For a three day period. For we a three day period. <laughs> and we're hoping to recover that position. So spread the news in Ireland. That's amazing. You know, and That's it, amazing. it is. It's truly. It's only we were able to get I guess on the show. I'm not trying to. <laughs> so now I know why I'm here. <laughs> you're our bridge, Father Larkin. You're our bridge. Yeah. He's like, you're number one in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. No thanks. But I He's like, okay, I'll do it. So um, where, where was uh, Archbishop Hurley? What was his diocese? He was from Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, Originally, yeah, he was the bishop of Cleveland first. That's right. Oh, yeah, but what what bishop? What was he? What was the diocese down here? Was it Saint Augustine? It was Saint Augustine. Saint Augustine. He was the an state, archbishop. The state of Florida. It was the right. state of Florida. Okay. And his he had seat an was honorary here. title. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Archbishop was an honorary title for him because Saint Augustine wasn't an archdiocese. Then Miami gotcha. later became the archdiocese. And that was like a major political uh, issue there because there were some yeah. backdoor uh, conversations happening around Archbishop's watch, <laughs> and he was not a happy camper, and he was a diplomat for the church. I mean, he really confronted communism to the, a heroic level, and the vision that he had that Father Larkin was speaking to firsthand in your experience going throughout the state of Florida and establishing 
properties all throughout the state in underdeveloped areas. And now in the state of Florida, we look at the prosperity of the church of Florida in relationship to so many other places. It's because of Archbishop Joseph Patrick, Patrick Hurley, yeah. you know, and, and he, when he we was, look to the mission grounds too, yeah. the great cross, he was the one who constructed that great cross on the mission grounds. Yeah. He had a great sense of history for the diocese mm-hmm. and, and, and of course he, uh, he was the ambassador for, from the Vatican to Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. And he was over there at the time that Cardinal Stepinak mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. being tried. And there is a great story and a great photograph showing Cardinal Stepinak being led into the courtroom by two uh, soldiers. And Archbishop Hurley, short stature, rose uh, to his feet mm. and bowed to the cardinal. Mm. And, and they, th- there was nothing uh, the, the Russians or anybody else could do to him because he was an American citizen. Mm. But he, he was afraid of nothing. He was just a brave man and he was a brave man for the church. He, mm. was, he put the church ahead of anything personal in his life. Archbishop uh, Hurley, a short man in stature, but a giant in the history of the church of the United States of America, that's for sure, and most especially our diocese. We're very blessed to have, you know, your firsthand experience and interacting with this very decisive bishop, a a bishop of influence, calling you from Ireland to the Diocese of St. Augustine, having that diocesan uh, charism of really being a priest for the people. We could already hear that in your experience of going to an unfamiliar area, working with a population of a Polish community, so an Irishman working with the Polish community and falling in love, especially with that the the older Polish community, and they were farmers uh, primarily. And you came from a farming background as well, and you were there in Flagler County for a little while. And then, how did your ministry start to materialize from there? Well, you know, after Flagler Beach, and uh, I, at the time, I you know uh, I, I was given another appointment, and that was uh, to go and teach at Bishop Moore High School in Orlando. So I went there and t- for the rest of the school year. And at the end of that, then um, I uh, went back to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. And uh, I, I spent all together at Catholic U uh, one full year and seven hot summers, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and and uh, that was uh, the extent of my... And I studied English as my major, and uh, and then I taught English. Uh, when I came back from Catholic U, I was appointed to Clearwater Central Catholic, mm-hmm. which was a brand new high school in the diocese at the time, uh, maybe the second year in operation. So I, I went, I taught there for a couple of three years, and then uh, was appointed to Bishop Kenny and the pastor of Most Holy Redeemer on the west side of town. And uh, I was stayed at Kenny for teaching for seven years. So talk about driving, Father Larkin. I mean, from Flagler to Bishop Moore, where that is, to Clearwater, and then back to BK, and at Most Holy Redeemer, you were putting some mileage on the car. And just for the boys out there that may be listening in the Diocese of Orlando, St. Pete, Tampa area, you got to remember, it was one diocese back in the day. So honor your mother and make sure you come back to Mission Nombre de Dios and and realize where the roots are. Because those boys out there in Clearwater always like to say, we had the first mass. You guys keep on saying you had it at St. Augustine. It was all one diocese back then. I picture uh, like an anchorman type fight. Going <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's all love. It's all love between us and, Did the, you and just the church Father Florida. Smith with a trident? <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's, here's something that's really interesting to me, because you, you had mentioned that you've been a priest for 63 years, uh, and that's, from a lot of people, that's an entire world-changing epoch of time, you know? I mean, so many things have happened. What are some of the biggest things that you've seen change in, in, in both the church and society over that, you know, that period of time from when you were a fresh Irish face all the way up to now 
um, you know, at 88, still looking better than Father Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll that's, take not, it. that's not going to come out on this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he'll keep it in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, to, uh, you know, rib me. <laughs> the, well, I was at Bishop Kenny when Vatican Council II took place. And uh, we tried an experiment at Bishop Kenny, and uh, we had the homeroom teachers and the total senior class, 264 students in the gym, and, and I would lecture them. And one of the things that uh, we did at the time was uh, the 16 documents of Vatican Council II. And my intention was to try to, to get these seniors at Bishop Kenny to realize, you know, the amount of uh, material and uh, different things that were covered in Vatican Council II, and hopefully that they would remember. I remember getting a letter from one uh, girl from the class, and she went to Loyola in New Orleans, and they had an entrance exam, and honest to God, she wrote back and she said, thank God, Father, that you did the documents of Vatican II, because that's what they asked about in the entrance oh, wow. exam. And she said, you know, and I aced it, she said. And I remember, well, you know, kids, and but I was at least one out of 264. <laughs> uh, listen, one listen. That's like one me listen. with my seven kids. At least one of them listen. Which, you know, it, it was uh, at least, you know, some recognition. But uh, naturally, it was difficult to get seniors in high school uh, interested in, you know, Vatican Council II. You know, even though... You know the vernacular was coming in, and 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 that was that was big. I mean, mm. the vernacular uh, being used for the mass, mm. you know, uh, and those kids, all they had known was Latin. Like, and we were uh, ordained, and we said mass mm -hmm. in Latin for X number of years, like up until 1965 or 66, right around that time. So. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That the was, change, the changes to ce to celebrate mass in the vernacular and the local language of the people was a huge change. And yes, you know the practice of that, being able to discern what was being said, and there was a lot of excitement, a lot of uh, a lot of changes. And sometimes, Absolutely. you know, there's a, there's a lot of critics out there of of what happened post conciliar church, and a lot of people taking. Uh, creative liberties to kind of invent their own masses and whatnot. But in your experience, more of the positive elements of, of that uh, experience is just such an enriching testimony to hear because sometimes the chatter online, you hear people who never even lived through it have such a critical view and 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 really almost a demonstrative uh, position and, and sure. they never really they never really participated in it. So what were some of the other advantages that you were seeing and some of the fruits that you were seeing from the council? Well you know it, it was good for me as an individual uh, to have to read and study each of the documents. Yeah. And uh, you know there are a lot of people today that have never read uh, the documents from Vatican Council too, and I don't know whether I would have read them all in detail, except that I had to teach it in the classroom. It's the best so, way to learn is to yeah. teach so, it. <laughs> exactly, you, you and you retain more so of it. True. And, you know, but it was definitely um, a, a big a time of change in uh, you know our lives as priests and how we dealt with kids. You know, in high school and and. Uh, you know, and, and try to, a lot of misinformation came out of Vatican II, even though they had done it in the sunshine, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of it, misinformation, uh, you know, and uh, some priests, you know, even dropped some of the uh, devotions that we had. And, and that was never the intention of mm -hmm. Vatican Council II. And some people dev dropped devotion to our Blessed Mother and that was never intended. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, 
a chapter in the Constitution of the Church is devoted to Mary, even though, you know, there were a lot of people saying, well, Mary is not going to be as important. Well, the Vatican Council, two people uh, made sure Mm -hmm. that Mary was going to be remembered and that she was a part of the church. As a matter of fact, the mediatrix, Mm -hmm. you know, of all grace, you know, of all grace. So that was that was a a transitional time, you know, and uh, at the time you would, you know, you'd be very conscious of it and and uh, hopefully be ready to answer questions that the students would Mm -hmm. ask. They were uh, Kids in Catholic high schools are very smart. You know, wisdom with Father Larkin right now. You know, make make sure because this is in a land of misinformation and you know digital dodging and and you know headliners and the the modern uh, journalism that we have now. You know, so many people have generated critical opinions about all sorts of things. And something that you bring is a wisdom of. Actually, read the documents. So many people have a <laughs> critical view of Vatican II, but have never read the documents. Yep. So many that people have true. a critical view of Pope Francis and never even read any of his 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 materials. Absolutely, you know, and they they're Absolutely. governed by headlines and their conversation with their girlfriend over a glass of Chardonnay, and then it, it becomes politicized and all these different things. Like, Absolutely. you know, to to uh, there are things we'll, that we'll release videos and we'll have thumbs down before it's even. It, been able to be exactly, yeah. exactly. So right. you know, and and look, everybody is has the right to express in the freedom of speech, you know, a position, but make it a position based on actual data yeah. and actual conversation and the reviewing of material Absolutely. intellectually and yeah. form your position, express yourself without just kind of blasting these violent emotional rants. We are made for more than that. And and we do have intelligence. And we're blessed at the Catholic Talk Show that we have a family of followers, subscribers. And if you are still on this channel right now and you haven't subscribed on our YouTube feed, hit the subscribe button, click the little bell, and make sure you're giving a thumbs up because this man has lived for over 60, what, 68? 63. 63 yeah. years of priesthood. You know, that deserves a thumbs up. And I know for me to you, Father Larkin, you are such a huge inspiration. You're a legend in the diocese. And I'm so grateful that I get to turn to you for your wisdom all the time and work every week with you. And what a joy to be able to share Father Larkin's witness and testimony with you. Now, the only way that we're able to do this show is by the generosity of our patrons. So we don't want to go any further without expressing our gratitude to those who financially support the show. You're the ones who help us get the equipment, have the travel costs, and all these things met behind the scenes. I mean, the beard bomb that Howard needs to make that beard look beautiful, there's a cost associated with that. And even he's off camera, he still needs to look good. So please consider if you're on the fence of being a financial supporter of the show, check out catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. You'll see every way to support us, all these really cool tiers. And to say thank you, we want to send you really cool materials and hoodies and all sorts of gear just so we kind of build up the charism of the talk show and celebrate our Catholic faith because we are proud to profess what we believe in and we want to make that visible. And we need your help to make that visible. So please consider becoming a patron today. Yeah, and I want to give a real quick shout out to our two sponsors, Exodus 90 and Hollow. These are two of the best apps in the church today. Hollow is the number one prayer app, and over a billion prayers have been prayed for it. You can go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow to try it for free. And Exodus is the number one app for Catholic men to become the man that God intended them to be through prayer, asceticism, and fraternity. You can go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Exodus to try that now for free as well. So a big shout out to our patrons and our sponsors who allow us to do this show. Amen. Now, I know there's one thing that you're very grateful for is that Father Larkin, even though he's 88 years old and retired, can still take a mass for you every now and again. Oh, <laughs> every Monday and Friday. And I tell you, you know... Father Larkin has such an impact, and I love sitting in the back of the church, even just sneaking in. I know he always sees me, but I like sneaking in. He's in the back with and, sunglasses and, and listening, like a white shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> and listening into his beautiful homilies. And, you know, if you're out there and you want to listen in or, or get to know Father Larkin as a priest, you can check out my YouTube channel at the parish. 
Father Pagano. And every Monday and Friday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, Father Larkin is celebrating Mass and sharing beautiful homilies and reflections on the gospel and proclaiming the good news. Such a fruitful ministry. And uh, we encourage you to check out Father Pagano on YouTube. And lastly, I would like to say how beautiful it is to have two priests, generational, probably a couple generations mm -hmm. removed here. Mm -hmm. uh, just the love that you guys share for the priesthood and for each other and the fraternity there. I'm sure our listeners has, have heard that. Mm -hmm. I just want to express our gratitude for that. Yeah. It's true. Don't it's, cry. I'm, I'm about that, to. I'm about to pull don't cry. Right now. That's why I got it in my top pocket. <laughs> so I think that's actually a good question. You know, um, and I'm sure a lot of people have wondered this, that priests, you know, typically will retire at a certain age, depending on the diocese. Um, but then what do retired priests do? I mean, you, you're a priest forever. But then your faculties and your demands of your time are, are different. So what, you know, what's the life of a retired priest, or at least in your experience? Well, you know, it, 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 it's, a great, it's a great question because, you know, most everybody feels that when they retire, uh, at least in the beginning, they feel they're going to have nothing to do and they worry about having nothing to do and how they're going to fill in the time. I never thought I would say this, but... I am busier now <laughs> than uh, almost as busy as the time I was working. And it, it is uh, very fulfilling. And I don't want to uh, go through any itemized list of sure, things, sure. but, uh, you know, but I, I, I enjoy very much working with Richard. Uh, he's a very welcoming pastor. And the people love him, and it's a pleasure. And I just love going over there to Starlings, uh, and uh, the the I I spent um, about you were just an there hour. this morning at the assisted living at Starling. Right. This about morning. an hour and fifteen twenty minutes, and you know a mass was like about a half hour. But talking to them, I just sat down and talk to them afterwards and let them, <laughs> you know, let them yeah. tell their story. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, uh, it's a, a joyful experience because you're talking to them and they, you know, you know that they appreciate so much. And, and it's a great idea to have this mass. It's kind of an extension of the parish for them. Mm -hmm. And they, mm -hmm. they feel a, at home and they yeah. feel like, uh, that the parish cares about them. And, mm -hmm. and that's very important for mm -hmm. people who sit in an assisted living place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, Father Larkin came into the house before we shot the show and he was sharing about John, who is a, a professional <laughs> golfer and a trainer. And I mean, he's constantly giving me advice on my game. I just, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not working. And I think it's more me than it is him because the man is brilliant. But it, it's, it's true. It's, you know, being a priest to receive the witness and the story and the testimony of the people that you serve and to receive their, you know, their journey and, and to celebrate that before God as a priest is one of uh, the most valuable and intimate things as a celibate we get to experience, I think. Absolutely. Well, this John Murphy is, um, <laughs> he, he's, he's a character. he is a wonderful character. Yeah. Uh, not only does he have a <laughs> tremendous sense of humor, he does. but he is uh, deeply in love with his Catholic faith. Yes. I mean, this guy, yes. and he loves it, and he and he kids, and he knows uh, he knows a lot of people. He had a business in addition to the uh, golf pro, where he uh, uh, he sold Irish crystal ah. in in. Uh, was up in Connecticut, and he had he was mentioning this morning the names of some uh, bishops who were his customers. <laughs> wow! And um, he had a little story to tell about each of them. It was it was it was. It was That'd be another show, I bet. I very, tell you, the Irish entertaining. It was very entertaining. It, it, it's true. The Irishmen yeah. are great storytellers, and. 
as a preacher, I always love listening to your stories. And even as you began the show, just sharing that poem. I mean, I know I just saw yeah. the disposition of all of us here. We're just like sitting there just listening. And I'm sure everybody listening and viewing, same exact disposition. And Father Larkin, the wisdom that you have, the stories that you have from your life experience, you know, what are some of the things that you live by, like the mottos you live by or the wisdom that you live by that's very meaningful to you, that keeps you going? Life is hard. Life is extremely hard. But what are the things that keep you going and, and, and keep you inspired? Well, you know, it, it, you have given out uh, books in the parish that, that are really like the one on, uh, by Matthew Kelly, Life is Messy. Mm. And, you know, you, you know, you... You know that life is messy and that it's not fair all the time. But when you read Matthew Kelly, uh, you get a totally uh, deeper perception of, you know, how messy it can be. Mm -hmm. And he is totally honest in his uh, witnessing to the fact that he did go, uh, he went through tough times, and but he, uh, he, again, the one thing that kept him was prayer, you know. Now, I, I, I faithfully pray. I, I spend about an hour and a half, two hours probably a day between the divine office, uh, the rosary, uh, the divine chaplet. I am a strong proponent of the chaplet. And, I, and if I'm called to a bedside, uh, it's one of those prayers that I will always say because mm -hmm. it's probably the best prayer mm -hmm. that you can say uh, where Jesus said, I will stand between my heavenly father and the dying person, not as a just judge, but as a merciful father. Mm -hmm. How powerful is that mm -hmm. and how consoling it is for somebody who is... Uh, uh, leaving this world and going on to their eternal reward. You know? Truly consoling. Absolutely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think prayer is the key, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. being grounded, staying okay. grounded in what you're doing, and, you know. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a good question. I think that we can kind of, this can be both for Father Rich and then for, you know, the other priests out there. So having been a priest for 63 years and being a seasoned man, what advice would you give specifically for priests and young men in the in the seminary right now, you know, from your experience, have this long life of a priesthood. Yeah, we do have a yeah. lot of friends out there that are discerning the priesthood that are mm -hmm. that are following the show week in and week out, and and uh, very proud of those in the seminary and our young priests out there. You know, hitting the hitting the vineyard with enthusiasm and their intrepid witness. I think that would be that's a phenomenal question. It it is a phenomenal question, and you know, I I, I there are younger priests whom I have talked to uh, under the leadership of John Snyder, Bishop John Snyder, and uh, even at, and under Felipe, Father Estevez, Bishop Estevez. And there's one thing that I always say to young priests. I say, if you don't know your own sermon, you can't expect the congregation to know it. You know? So make sure that you know your homily and that you don't get up there and read out uh, seven or eight minutes of material, which anybody can do. And because the competition in the media is so powerful now, uh, that's what we're not exactly competing with, but it's what challenges us, you know, and you've got to be able to uh, talk to people and that they would feel that at least you know what you're talking about and they will listen to you if you if they know if you have done your homework mm. you know mm. you know That's awesome. you know culturally speaking you know for a greater majority of history the general public were illiterate 
And it was the Catholic Church who really established schools and began the process, process of educating. And the retention rate of people in those times for listening and for being attentive to a prepared speech that was driven. I mean, I even had some older professors who read off of their notes and they've right. been teachers for 40, 50 mm, years. Right. So, you know, like the sense of retention and attentiveness was was through the roof. But to your point, I think it's such a excellent point. You know, we have been so accustomed to the constancy of media that has gone through post-production and our attention span continues to get smaller, 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 and smaller. And where, you know, traditional programming, it was a window of 30 minutes, a window of 20 minutes, and then commercialization in between. Now it's like moved to nine seconds, eight, nine seconds. CNN bought out the thing. You look at TikTok, you look at Instagram, you look at the feeds, you look at all these different things. The, the window is getting smaller and smaller and you're only your attention span is for a headline. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I really received that advice so well and and to realize that, you know, we have an important role to reverse this culture and to develop a greater attentiveness. Oh, absolutely. Wisdom, be attentive. And it, we should be able to exercise sitting down in silence, attentive to reading the scriptures, attentive to meditating, and developing that listening skill that helps us grow spiritually. But I, I, I will definitely keep that in mind as, uh, as, as your wisdom is shared with me, Father Larkin. Well, uh, Richard, your your reputation as a preacher is is uh, way higher than mine. I'm I'm just on a a lower wavelength. I mean, uh, I hear people talking about uh, you know how charismatic you are and what it rolls off your tongue. You don't you don't read it out. I mean, you 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 talk to people and you know what you're talking about, and uh, they know that, and that's. Uh, it's yeah, a, and I have positive. when you're preaching, you're a different guy than I know. I mean, you mm -hmm. really are something above and beyond what you you know are on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you really do have a gift for preaching. I, I'm humbled, Absolutely. guys. I'm humbled, Absolutely. and I'm, I'm grateful to God and the Holy Spirit. But I'm also humbled and grateful for great examples in Father Larkin and Father Larkin's impact and somebody like Father Tetlow who raised me as a as a youth director and to be, you know and having the examples of these wonderful preachers in my life and and, and cool. seeing that lineage you know it's pretty neat to see too yeah, from the outside yeah. generationally yeah. it's like Father Larkin Father Tetlow yeah. you know and I'm up and then I'm looking down like Clay Ludwig and like seeing yeah. Mac Hill and Matt Ryan King got and, and right, you know, and Ryan got yeah. kicked yeah. out yeah. Yeah. thanks be to God yeah. 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 <laughs> so Father Larkin and Father Tetlow, there's a blank space. Yeah, that's why I had to double cross. <laughs> a blank space. I love you. And speaking of Father Tetlow, he is waiting for a lunch at this very moment. Yeah, right. And Father Larkin, thank you so much for being so open, charismatically, yeah, to jump on the show. Completely is surprised. And but this conversation has been so enriching. And speaking on behalf of all of our viewers and listeners, thank you for your witness of priesthood. Thank you for your diligence and forbearance in prayer, sharing with us the heartbeat of your devotional life on a daily basis, scripture, the liturgy of the hours, that daily rosary, being exposed to the mercy of God and disposed through the diary of St. Faustina and living out that mercy in the chaplet of divine mercy. Your ministry to the sick is remarkable, and that has not abated. You continue to reach out to the people who are suffering the greatest poverty, and that's the poverty of body near death. You're, you're a true inspiration and a great example of priesthood, and we thank you. Well, thank you very much, Richard, but you are very kind, and it, it's a pleasure to work with you uh, yes, here sir. at St. John Paul's. Yes, sir. To many second. more years. For, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I'm Wilkes and Sanos, and I'm ready to move you into the curate's house. I don't have one yet, but I'm going to get you a curate's house at Artisan Lakes. <laughs> My friends, it's a great joy to be with you. Check out our partners. Hallow and Exodus today by going to our website, catholictalkshow.com forward slash Exodus or forward slash Hallow. Greatest material out there for you to grow and enrich your spiritual life. Again, consider becoming a patron, supporting great Catholic content like the Catholic Talk Show. And we want to continue to proclaim the good news throughout all of the countries, including our great country, Ireland, and resume that number one spot. So spread the news. <laughs> Catholic Talk Show is coming to you live next week. 
And we'll see you then. God bless. <laughs>